Hi, my name is Zihan. Today I will talk about the self-read message MIMO and some comparison with the traditional message MIMO. Self-read message MIMO was initially proposed in 2015 with its original motivation for providing uniformly high performance for all users in a given area. Its basic architecture is a large number of APs distributed in a large area connected to the CPU or CBRAN data center. And based on the different job division among APs and the CPU, it can be implemented in a centralized way or a distributed way in both uplink and downlink operation. And in this presentation, I will only consider the centralized uplink operation. In a fully centralized uplink operation, the APs will only act as uh, the remote radio heights, or we can call it relays. So APs will only forward receive the baseband pallet data, pallet and data signals to the CPU without acting the signal processing work. Instead, the CPU will do the channel estimation, the receive combining, and the data detection. Different from the cellular networks where the pallet assignment can be done in a cellular style, in self-free case, in order to achieve the scalability and avoid unnecessary power consumption and uh, the delay sprite, we need to select a set of serving APs for each user. Then we do the pallet assignment based on the AP selection result. Another way to do this is to firstly, we can assign pallets to all the users. Then we do the AP selection based on the pallet assignment result. Both ideas can be used for the algorithm design. After AP selection, the received combining for user K will only consider the received data signals from its serving APs instead of all APs in the network. In cellular message MIMO, the simple maximum ratio is widely adopted because it can achieve close to optimal performance. But the case is different in self-free message MIMO, where the effects of uh, channel hardening and favorable propagation are not so pronounced as shown in the next slide. And these two figures have compared the degree of these two effects in cellular networks and in cell-free networks. The left figure represents the degree of channel hardening, and the higher the variance is, the lower the corresponding effect is. So it's clear if the red line representing the self-ray network wants to achieve the same level of channel hardening with the blue line representing the cellular case, it needs eight times more total antennas in the network. And similarly, in the red figure representing the favorable propagation degree, uh, with the same uh, number of total antennas in cellular case and in self-ray case, for most users, in self-ray case, it will have a uh, um, relatively lower degree of favorable propagation, except when uh, two users are quite separated in self-ray case. Because in that scenario, these two users will be served by very different set of APs. But still, universally, in self-ray case, the degree of favorable propagation is not so obvious as in cellular case. That's why the widely adopted maximum ratio scheme in cellular case can, cannot be used in uh, the self-free case because it will highly underestimate the performance of the system. Instead, we need to turn to those interference surprising schemes like the MMSE and zero forcing based schemes. At the end of my presentation, I want to summarize some key points of algorithm design in self-ray networks. Firstly, we need to do the grouping the AP selection jointly with the pilot assignment to avoid some significant pilot contamination. Secondly, we need to use the interference mitigating signal processing schemes instead of the very simple maximum ratio processing scheme. Thirdly, in order to develop a user-centric self-ray system, we need to make sure the computational complexity will not scale with the number of active users. 
so we need to consider scalability in terms of the number of uh, active users and finally uh, we also need to consider the information that needs to be exchanged through the front hall network so we need to take the limited front hall ability into consideration so this is my presentation and thank you very much for listening Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions for uh, Jihan? You still have the time to apply this into the Q&A session. Uh, in the meanwhile, can I ask uh, Jihan to summarize uh, what are the, the main benefits of your approach in, uh, in this uh, self-free uh, MIMO configuration that you um, presented? Uh, okay, uh, Safari Mice and MIMO can be a main, uh, a main uh, different type of MIMO can be used in the Beyond 5G or 6G. And it's different from the traditional MIMO where the uh, a, a large number of antennas are co-located at the base station. In Safari Mice and MIMO, thanks to the distributed architecture of the system, we can benefit well, well, very well from the, uh, the macro diversity. So we can provide the, uh, the almost uniformly service for all the uh, users in a given area. Unlike in the traditional MIMO, we can suffer the, uh, the very large inter cell interference for those uh, cell edge users. So that's one. Uh, the the main improvement that Safari MIMO can can provide. I see, I see. Good. In fact, we have another question for for Costadinos if he's still here with us. Um, hello, Costadinos. Yes. Hello. Uh, so we we have another question that says uh, specific spectrum availability. Um, is uh, concluding to uh, the fact that private 5G uh, plus networks are preferable for critical application, for example, in AVs. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, maybe, okay, so uh, specific, yeah. So maybe for critical applications, um, license spectrum might be needed. Uh, but here we're talking about uh, massive connectivity, so it uh, it doesn't really make sense to have um, to have let's say license spectrum uh, for let's say um, operators uh, for five G usage because if you consider uh, all the use cases in five G um, spectrum sharing is it's like one of the best solutions you can do like a simple solution uh, to improve the the overall spectrum usage. Um, but yeah, at the same time, if you have some critical applications, maybe you want, uh, you don't want to have mobility with millimeter wave, or you may want to have a dual connectivity with millimeter wave to ensure that um, you you remain online. And also, depending on how much security you want or not, um, you may want to license the spectrum or not. All right. And we have one more uh, question coming from uh, Carlos. In Massive MIMO, how your algorithm operates to control pilot uh, contamination? And do you think uh, this could be applicable for overlapping? Okay, so uh, I, and like Massive MIMO, specifically Massive MIMO antennas is not really my, um, my expertise here. It's not in my expertise, uh, but I'm pretty sure we do have a lot of people in this uh, who joined this, uh, this conference that uh, do know more than me in uh, Massive MIMO. So um, yeah, you can you can join the, the session, the remote session after, and um, hopefully someone can uh, answer to your question. All right. Uh, are there any uh, other questions? If not, um, I would uh, strongly encourage you again to uh, meet our researchers in uh, Remo. Unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID restrictions, etc., we had to do this uh, online. So that's why we're taking opportunity uh, of uh, the new online uh, coffee break and coffee tours, uh, online tours, sorry, uh, to meet. Uh, so please join us in uh, Remo to meet with our uh, researchers. And if you still uh, found 
an interest on the on uh, these uh, presentations please uh contact us you can find the contact details in the the conference web website but also within uh, uh, the smart internet lab uh, uh, website so thank you uh very much for your uh, attendance and i guess that uh, with that we can uh, conclude our um, elevator uh, uh, speech session i hope that you all found it uh, useful and i uh, hope to see you again in, in uh, remote bye everyone